Welcome to Live and Unscripted with Susan Smith, Filting's first reality show. Good morning and welcome or good afternoon, depending on where in the world you are. I'm Susan Smith and you're in my studio, Stitched by Susan. That lovely intro with the kookaburras in the background is actually our very Canadian son, Will. He loves doing various voices, and so um, as promised over the last month or two or three, I finally got some new intro voices for you. So, Australia is the first one. So, those of you who are perhaps watching from Australia, let me know how he did and how we could perhaps improve on that. But that's kind of a fun thing. So, you're in my studio. Um, I'm a long arm quilter, just to give you a few sentences on me, because I know there are a few new people watching this morning that haven't been here before. Um, I'm a long arm quilter for hire, but in recent years, I have gotten more and more into teaching and also into doing digital type quilting like this so that I can reach more people. My style of quilting is very much uh, what I call couch quilts. So very usable, very practical, um, and often smaller sized quilts. And so what I usually quilt on this show is one project right from the loading all the way to the finish. And I'm basically inviting you into my studio to kind of watch over my shoulder throughout the process. So it's not a lesson per se. It's just an opportunity for me to talk through the things as I'm doing them. So today's project is a baby quilt with a velvety minky type backing. And so that's kind of going to be the focus today. How I load that, how I deal with the stretch that's involved in that minky, you know, some tension changes that we might think about. So that's kind of my process is I just talk through the things that are involved in the various quilt that I'm working on and just let you have a good look at that. It is unedited. We are live streaming. And so you'll get to see things in real time as they occur, even problems. We do not edit them out. So this, this is why we call this a reality show. Um, nothing is edited out at the end to to kind of make it look pretty right this this is the real thing this is really how it works um the speed wise you know it is shown in real time but i kind of laugh because over the years as i've done these reality shows i'm a talker i don't know what was your first clue but i'm a talker so i realize things do take longer just because i spend more time talking but you do at least get to see the quilting in real time so I hope that that is helpful to you in your quilting journey, just to see the loading process, the basting process, the thread choices, whatever the things are that come as part of a quilt. So before we dive in, just a couple of things I want to mention. One, this is interactive. So if you're watching live, feel free to post comments, to ask questions about the project in hand. Put two cues, if you would, in front of your question. That allows my husband, Dave, Mr. Producer, to find them all. And what I kind of do is quilt for a while and then take a break and answer some of those questions. And we need to go back and be able to find them. Okay, so QQ in front of them. Today, we did have one technical issue. So again, if you're watching this as a replay, it won't matter to you. But if you're watching it live, we usually stream on YouTube and Facebook. And of course, we use streaming software to do that. For whatever reason today, our software will not connect with Facebook. And so we've posted there too. Um, sending those people here to YouTube. But if you're watching it on YouTube, just know that in general, you can catch it either place. So whatever's more convenient for you, you can ask questions in either place and we, we grab them and, and answer them from either platform. So doing our best there. Okay, what have I missed? A few more credits. My husband, Dave, whom I call Mr. Producer, I've called him that already a few times. He's kind of behind the scenes, keeping all the balls in the air, juggling everything. And I sure appreciate it. This is not a one woman show could not do it on my own. So he's behind the scenes doing all of that. Um, I mentioned Will already, who does the various intro voices for us. That's our son. And our good friend, Dan, who provides the guitar music that you hear throughout the episodes. We're so grateful. It's so lovely and relaxing. And so many of you write in and comment about that and enjoy it as much as I do. So that's really fun. One other thing, um, YouTube and Facebook, as always, are free platforms to view on. But if you do care to support the show, you can do it very easily by going to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. All the funds that come in there, we pour back into improving our equipment, our sound, our lighting, our cameras, etc. So you all have been very generous over the years. And at the very end of the show, we have a little rolling credit going of those who have um, do a monthly contribution there. So you can either do one time for as little as $5 or 
or you can take a monthly or an annual option. That's entirely up to you and whatever you choose, we appreciate it and we appreciate you coming and viewing and supporting the show. Okay, let's get started with our loading and then we'll talk about a few more things as we go on. Um, please feel free to keep chiming into the comments where you're watching from and if you're working on something in particular today and I'll get started with the loading. Okay, here is our backing. Isn't this pretty? It's this soft peachy pinky color and it's very velvety. Um, sometimes you'll see Minky with a super, super short nap. This is not that. This is the very velvety type. And this is the thing that sometimes stumps long arm quilters. Lengthwise, there's a lot of stretch in this fabric. Crosswise from selvage to selvage, there's a little less, but still some stretch. So the million dollar question is, how do I load it and how do I avoid having stretch in that finished quilt, having the backing stretched tighter than the top? And this is a big deal and something that you need to strongly consider. So first off, I mentioned again, the most stretch is top to bottom. So my preference when I can is always to load with the selvage on my long arm rails so that I have less stretch than on my long arm from top to bottom. Does that make sense? So it's side to side of the fabric, but I'm going to load it so it's top to bottom on my long arm. And that way I, I have lessened the risk of over tightening my rails and having that stretched too much. So the most stretch is going to be sideways once I've got it loaded. So let's start doing that and we'll just talk about it more as we go. I'm stitching today on a Bernina Q24. Her name is Stella. I don't name all my machines, but I do always name my long arms because they're my buddies. We do, we spend a lot of time together. <laughs> and I should mention too, one of my setup tricks, this is my front leader, which I'm going to be loading onto, and you can't see it, I don't think because of the machine, but at each end, I've just got my, my um, anchoring clip holding each end. This keeps the leader up as opposed to having it flopping and me trying to deal with that. And I just do that when I'm taking one quilt off. I go ahead and clip those ends so this never flops down and it's just ready set for the next quilt. Tiny time saver, but a very nice one. I'm using my red snappers to load. So there's already a little rod in my leader hem right here. And this C-clamp will be snapping right over that. Important that you have a straight edge for this front uh, baseline edge that you're loading. And of course I do because it's a selvage. So here already, you guys, I'm thinking about the stretch. Remember, my most stretch is this way. Lengthwise on the fabric has a lot of stretch ability. And I have to be absolutely sure to not stretch it out. How do I know that? I'm looking at the fabric that's laying down in front of me. If I pull on it, I can start to see kind of angled lines in it and I do not want to see that. So I've got to relax with my hand and I almost have to ease this edge under the C-clamp. The selvage edge is just, it's, it's slightly, slightly, slightly ruffled as it comes off the bolt. So I've got to make sure that I'm getting that in flat and again, once I've got it clipped, I can look at this again. Is that laying nice and smooth? Do I see any pull or any evidence of stretch? And if so, I'll go back and redo it until I get it right. This is just critical because it's setting you up for either success or not. I've worked with Minky a lot of times, so I've kind of gotten a feel for how much I need to ease that in or how much um, is too much when it comes to stretch. You might need to do it a time or two or three before you're satisfied with how it looks. But as we roll this whole backing on, I'll keep on looking at it and looking at it from every angle, making sure I see no evidence of any stretching going on. Can you see here right along the top of my snapper, it almost looks a little roughly there. That's correct. If I pulled that out smooth, this, this end would be stretched. Mr. Producer is moving the camera a little. Do I need to go further to the right? Okay. So can you see that now? It, it appears from where I'm standing to have a little bit of ruffling, but in fact, the fabric is perfectly smooth and that's what's important to me. Then I'll take off my end clips. 
And now I'll go around to the other side of the long arm. Now I'm pulling my minky straight over the long arm rail. Again, I'm judging at every step. I'm looking at that as a whole. Do I see any evidence of stretching, of being pulled to one side or the other? And if so, I'm adjusting until it lays really, really smoothly. And now I'll start rolling it up on the rail. And I'm just watching from the front until the edge of my backing comes close to the edge of my leader. And then I'll walk back around and clip that in place. Looks nice and smooth. I'm pleased. Now Minky is a bit heavy, so I'm going to have to be sure this does not pull off the leader. I want to get it attached really straight again. I'm just using a magnetic bar to hold that one end. This end is pulling a bit. Um, I'm just pulling it back into place because I do have a selvage edge on this side too. It helps me. Um, I know that this edge is straight, so that helps me. Where are you seeing a wrinkle, Mr. Producer? We are seeing a wrinkle. Let's move left just a touch. Let's see how that looks. I couldn't see that swoop from where I was standing. I would have seen it when I walked back around to the front. So Mr. Producer has just saved me some time. He's getting really knowledgeable about quilting. One of these days he'll be hosting the show. I'm just going to walk down to the end and put my uh, latch in place so my rail doesn't keep rolling. I generally try not to be adjusting or fiddling with the hem on this side. Because if a backing is not perfectly square, I let the excess hang off on this side. But in this case, because I know it selvages on both sides, I know that it is square. And I just, my knowledge of Minky lets me know it's so heavy, it's wanting to pull off a bit. And I'm just nudging it back into place until my hem line or my selvage line um, is even all along this side. And that just comes with experience working with it. But I've given you the high points of what you need to look for, the absolute smoothness and not being stretched out. That is just so, so critical. Good deal. And now as I ratchet my front rail up, I'm leaving this a little more relaxed than I typically do when I'm working with a cotton backing because there is some stretch in this. Most stretch is still from side to side, but there is some stretch this way. And the way to avoid that is do not over tighten these rails, right? Do not have tension on them this way. So I'm only tightening my rail enough so that this is, is not sagging or, or being allowed to wrinkle on me. That's all I'm doing. I might even loosen it one notch. Um, I'm going to show you guys another trick. When I'm looking at this as a whole right now, this side is looking a little more taut than this side. I have a bit more sag here. You can probably see that on camera. But I know that I had a selvage top and bottom. So I know that my fabric is even in length this way. So what I'm going to do is roll it back and forth on the rails a little bit, and that's going to even out. Watch this. Let me move Stella a little bit more. So what I'm doing is I'm holding just with my hand, I'm putting some resistance on the rail that it's coming off of so that there's a tiny bit of tension on the fabric and I'm just rolling it back and forth. So again, I don't know if you can see my hand on the top rail, but I'm holding just a little bit of tension on that, rolling it onto the bottom rail. And look at that. My quilt backing has magically smoothed out and I'm relaxing it a little bit more. So now I've got the same tension here as here. And that idea of rolling back and forth is really helpful if you've got like a pieced backing or a um, 108 inch wide backing that's not quite squared up grain wise. Rolling that back and forth with a little bit of tension on the bars can fairly magically fix that. 
Okay, on to the batting. Oh, okay, apparently there's a question about the rails. So let's take that before we go on. Do you want to put the main camera on or no? Betsy, the lowest roller on the left side does not look like it is rolling on straight. That's a really great point, Betsy. So she's talking about the roller at the bottom. And here's the thing. Which camera am I on? This one over here. This edge of the minky is not cut straight. I can see it right here. It's, it's a pretty distinct curve and it angles. So I was aware of that putting it on. Because I know that my selvages, you know, are straight to grain, obviously. They're the selvage. And because I pulled it on straight and I don't have any creases going one way or the other, I'm confident that my fabric is now squared up. I just need to be aware of that, that you've pointed out, Betsy, so that my I don't run out of backing at the far end because the, this left side is shorter as I get to the bottom of the quilt. Is that all making sense? So I appreciate you pointing that out. No, it's, it's wider here and it's shorter as I advance my quilt. This backing edge is going to move in a little bit, probably two inches. So I need to make sure my quilt is in far enough. I know that I have plenty of backing, so it's going to be okay. Here's another tiny little tip. These are the things maybe you already know. And so if you do, just ignore me. But if you hadn't thought of this, this might be of value to you. My batting, I usually buy in a roll. This is 80-20. Um, it's very serviceable, usable, couch quilt type batting. I buy it 120 inches wide, which is the widest that you can get. And so I actually have several small quilts going through my studio this week. So what I did is I measured, I got a series of those quilts. And in this case, I had three of them that were similar in size. And the one I'm doing right now is the widest. It's 45 inches. So I cut my batting a little wider than that. So I've got 120 inches folded in half. And I cut it a little longer than 45 inches. And then I've loaded it on my long arm long ways. So it's narrow, right? But the 120 inches is running way down. And I did one quilt already last night. Now I'm going to do another one. And then I'm going to get yet a third one out of that. Does that make sense? So I've got this, this wide but short strip of batting. And I'm getting three small quilts out of it. It's the most efficient way um, to do quilts. And sometimes I just do two side by side. But just... Just trying to be efficient with my batting. And I wish, you'll see as I put the quilt on, I wish I had cut it a little bit longer. Um, it does not have very much excess. But I'm going to show you one other trick. Those of you who watch often will notice that this is different from my usual style. I'm going to take a second and actually baste just the batting in place. This is an extra step I don't always take, but Minky Fabric has such a slick back on it that this wants to shift right it doesn't take much pulling for it to literally fall out of place so i'm actually going to take a second and run a basting stitch just across the batting and you see as i said i have plenty of backing so i'm not worried about that running out in the area where i know it gets shorter at the bottom end let's just run a quick basting stitch here and we'll talk about thread too as we go along but now let's focus on the basting Dave, would you mind flipping my, that knob? Thank you. So Mr. Producer was walking along the back of the quilt, so I had him engage my one belt. So I've now got my machine um, kind of in a horizontal rut, so I'm getting a nice straight line here. This will be beneficial when I go to put my quilt on and I know that it will be straight. When I do this on cotton quilts, I often just do it by eye. Um, but cotton just sort of sticks in place a little better. Minky being a little slipperier doesn't stick quite as well. So I baste a little more. I'm a little more careful with the placement of things on it. So that's our batting in place. And here comes our little quilt. And it's a little sweetie. Very subtle colors. The piecing is in gray and white. All kinds of scrappy soft grays, all kinds of scrappy white on whites, and then this very soft peachy border. You'll see what I mean. I wish I had cut my batting a little bit wider, but there is enough. And as a little side note here, if you're using up a piece of batting that's this close to 
It's totally all right to not have much extending beyond the edge of your quilt. But what you don't want to do is have your batting be, you know, a half inch short and stretch it out. You could, but you don't want to because what will happen is when you take it off the long arm, it's going to pull back in. So exactly the same uh, dilemma as we face with the minky. If we do any stretching on the long arm, then when we release it off the long arm, it's going to pull back in and our quilt is actually going to want to curl toward the back. And that's why it's so critical to not have any stretch in it. So I do have enough batting, just, just. And since I have that lovely straight basting line on the top now, I'm just kind of using that to line up my quilt. Now I know that it's nice and straight, beautiful. And we'll go ahead and baste. Okay, on to thread. Um, sure. So a few people are asking, I guess, about the dead bar on my machine. So Mr. Producer is going to bring a camera around so I can show you. But let me also say, last week I did an Ask Me Anything episode in which we had a camera and I walked through. I did have a quilt loaded, but I gave a lot more conversation about how I use my leaders and how things are arranged. So maybe go back and have a look at that too. But now you're getting a view of it, okay? So here's my, do you want to focus on this one first? Here's my lower leader and the bottom end of my backing is attached to this one. On some machines, on many machines, they'll recommend that your top is attached to it, but I've got my backing on it flowing over the belly bar and then attached up here. When I was loading this top edge, I had my leader under that dead bar and flopped right over. And that's when I did that loading process on the other side. And then when I released it, it flops down like this and it's under the dead bar, which is where I need it to be for quilting purposes. Okay, we're all set. Okay, that camera will go back in place and forgive the wobbles for a jiffy while Mr. Producer gets that back in place. So we're going to baste up the left side, across the top, and down the right. I do have my belts engaged. So what that means is I've got a Qmatic um, digital system on my machine. And in order to use that, I have to um, engage the belts, we call it. It's a, little, it's a little clamp that fits into a belt. And the belt then drives the machine. Does that make sense? So for the purposes of basting, if I engage those belts, that really helps me to get a really nice square 90 degree angle on my corners because I know I've got a perfect vertical line and a perfect horizontal. Different machines are different here. Some call them channel locks and they're magnets and they hold your rails in place. In that case, you might have to turn it on for your vertical one and then turn that one off and turn it on for your horizontal. But in my case, my machine has something called an easy glide and for those of you who might be driving Berninas, um, watch for an episode about this coming up shortly because this is such a cool feature. So my belt is still engaged, but it's not a hard latch. It's just resistance. So I can still quilt in the other direction, if that makes sense. So my, my vertical belt is still engaged right now, but my easy glide is helping it flow smoothly once I get it started. There is still resistance top to bottom, so it's staying in my nice straight line, but I'm able to move the machine. So that is a Bernina feature. So your feature might be a little different. And like I said, if yours is magnetic, you might have to turn it on for each direction and then off to do the other direction. And again, when I do cotton quilts, I often don't fuss with the belts. I often do it by eye. Um, I just like to take a little more care with the minky. It's just a little more fiddly. It has a little more move in it. So a little more control, I feel like, is not a bad thing. So now having had those belt um, engagements on, I now know that I've got perfect 90 degree corners and perfectly square and straight side and top in my basting. So I'm moving Stella all the way back to the left and now I will disengage those belts because we're going to do free motion quilting. Now, 
Clamping is another tricky thing with Minky, and I'll show you why. Side camera is probably the best bet, so I'll move Stella out of the way. These are the clamps I typically use for the side of my quilt. I love them because they're long. They put nice even tension on all of this throat space, but they have a super, super, super slim channel that I've got to fit that backing into. And I have learned the hard way. Minky almost never fits in and it's not going to today. It's too velvety and too thick to fit in there well. So this is simply not going to work today. So I'm left then with my clamps that come with the machine, which are these elasticized clamps. What I don't love about these is that when you use them alone, they tend to pull right here. And then I have a second one, which is going to pull right here. And if you put very much tension on them at all, you get this kind of scallopy shape, right? But again, knowing I'm working with Minky, knowing the most stretchiness is from side to side at my long arm frame right now, I'm going to put almost no tension on these. Really, it's just the weight of them. So I'm just tightening the elastics enough to take up the slack and a tiny smidge more so that I don't have pull happening right here. Because if I pull, that backing will pull. It's got stretch, right? If I have any poundage of pulling on that, it's going to stretch. And I do not want to do that. So I'm just double checking that these are super light. Like when I get it to the edge of my quilt, I move it in about a half an inch. That's all the tension that there is on that elastic strap. So again, these are just the ways that I've worked out over time of managing the stretch of the minky. And it has worked well. I've quilted lots and lots of minky quilts over the years. They are so, so incredibly cozy to use. Okay, our edges are all secure. All that's left is this front rail. Make sure everything is smoothed down. Make sure that my seam lines are running nice and evenly with the rail. And I'll do that with every advance. That way I know each one is square as I'm working. Clap on my magnetic bars. And we're ready to quilt. Okay, do we have any more questions while I get a sip of water? I shall move Stella out of the way. Okay. Val, I'm using isocord thread. My needle package suggests a size 16 needle. Why? Wondering why you cho choose to use 14. 14 to me is a very all-purpose needle. It works on almost all quilts. So that's my personal reason. I can go from quilt to quilt to quilt and not have to change very often. Um, it's got to be a very heavy quilt before I go with a more robust needle. Um, that's kind of my reasoning. Kim, how beneficial do you find loading to the lower front bar normally meant for the quilt top is when dealing with the added bulk of Minky? Well, my reason for it, Kim, the reason I load my backing to that bar in the first place is so that I can use these magnetic bars, right? I love to float my tops, meaning they're not attached, right? My top is just hanging down in front of me, but this front edge still needs to be secured in some way. And I've chosen to use magnets. You know, you can also find C-shaped clamps that go over top, but in some way that needs to be secured. So the beauty of loading uh, my backing, rolling up on that lower rail is I never have a buildup of fabric on the belly bar. I never have multiple rolls, right? My quilt just passes over it and down. So my magnetic bars always adhere, always stick. That's my reason for using them and for loading on that bottom bar. Uh, Kim, don't forget the magnet bar you left on the frame table. Actually, Kim, that magnet bar lives there because I always use it when I'm loading my backings. It's kind of my, my third hand when I need to hold that backing in place. So it's a short one and it always lives there. Sharon, what thread do you use most and is the quilt top flannel? The quilt top is not flannel. It's regular quilting cottons. Um, today I have Isocord 40 weight thread loaded. I'm also using quite a bit of Wonderfill these days. I just didn't have Wonderfill in a white enough color. It was a little too creamy today. I'm liking the Wonderfill thread a lot. They're very similar, honestly, 100% poly um, 40 weight threads. And what I've got on today is an eggshell. I fiddled around a little bit since we're on the thread topic. With what color? I looked at a pale silver 
but I didn't like the silver in the white and I didn't love it in the peach. So I ended up going with the eggshell, which is more like the white on white fabrics. Okay, that's it. And I have the same thread loaded in the bobbin as I do on the top. Exactly the same. Okay, what else do we need to talk about? I'm probably going to stitch with um, the regulator on today, at least to begin with. I've got my stitches per inch set at 10. And I happen to have my 72S foot on, which is actually a ruler foot, which is not necessary today. I could do it with a darning foot. Um, but that's, that, to me, that's kind of an all-purpose foot, and I often just leave it on all the time. Oh, quilting design. Well, you'll see it as I get started. I chose to do a paisley today. I thought and thought about what to put on this quilt. I know that it is for a little girl, but I just felt like flowers were too much. I don't know. The inside portion of the quilt is all made up of half square triangles. And, you know, it's kind of graphic. And then these soft borders, and I just, I got out my plexiglass sheet and I played around with a couple floral things, but they just didn't sit right. So I came back to the paisleys and I thought, that suits to a T. Still very soft. But not overtly floral. So, yeah, I'm happy with it. This does not happen on all that many quilts that I get to quilt on a solid fabric that you can really see the quilting design. So many of these episodes are, in fact, on client quilts, and so sometimes the visibility on the fabric is not great. But today you can sure see it well. Another foot that I could have used today would be some type of cup-shaped clip. So I have a couple options in my Bernina. I can use a couching foot, which is a cup shape. I could add a cup clip to this foot that I already have on. The beauty of a cup-shaped or spoon-shaped foot is that it glides very smoothly over um, kind of bulky seam allowances and where these are meeting at the corners is a little bulky. This foot seems to be doing fine. You can see I'm not going uber fast and so slowing it down a little bit can help with that. The reason that I chose not to put the cup clip on is because it does limit visibility. So sometimes you just have to go with it because you've got a quilt that's so thick you just need it and it's very it's kind of magical in how well it works. But for today's purposes, I thought I'm going to try it with this foot so that I've got that great visibility and it seems to be working fine. comment that I get super frequently or maybe question is a better word 
um, from aspiring quilters is how do you not quilt yourself into a corner? You know, how do you keep your, your line of movement open across your quilt top? You're really able to see this at play today. I kind of quilt in a diagonal sort of fashion. So the areas furthest away from me at the top of the quilt, nearest to my back rail, I'm quilting further out. And then the areas closer to me is a little slimmer. I'm, I'm not sure what words to use here, but watch the picture and you'll start to see it. Um, and I kind of weave back and forth in that diagonal fashion. And that keeps me from getting an awkward corner far away from me that I'm not able to work my way into. Mr. Producer standing here with a question. One sec. What's happening? Is it glaring on the machine? Yeah. Okay, you guys, we're going to we're gonna experiment a little bit here. I'm going to try turning the lights off on the machine and see if that's a better look. Does that look better? There we go. Okay. So you're going to see the little red glow of my cameras now. But sometimes those pale fabrics do really reflect almost the light. But here's what I mean. I'm quilting way out to my right at this top edge. And then as I work my way down the quilt toward me... I'm quilting less and less, so more toward the left. So I'm kind of moving in this diagonal line across the quilt. And it just avoids getting that area at the top where I've quilted close to me, but I've got an area far away from me that still doesn't have any quilting and I can't get in there. That's how I avoid it. And it's not a hard and fast rule. It's just a way to sort of organize my quilting that really helps. Helps me stay out of those awkward corners. Let me know what you think of my paisley choice. You know, what I was going for was soft and feminine, but not overtly floral. So see if you think I nailed it. Or if you have any other thoughts, I'd love some ideas. I'm always open to fresh new ideas for, a, for an edge to edge quilting design. I mentioned earlier on that making usable, lovable couch quilts, I call them, is kind of my style and this is a great example of that you know some quilters would look at this and think well i've got to do a custom design on that i've got to do something special in the border you know something that will highlight that very graphic piecing and you absolutely could you absolutely could but i i'm kind of on a mission to show how beautiful edge to edge quilting can be it kind of gets a bad rap as being sort of settling for second best and i don't think that it is i think when you put a lovely texture like this over the whole quilt by the time it's used and washed and snugly that texture is all you see that baby is not going to appreciate frankly a fancy border you couldn't care less this way you can get more quilts done and I said he couldn't care less but actually it's a she in this case but in many cases I find that's true so many family quilts are made for you know, either new babies as this one is, or maybe, um, you know, high school or college graduates, or perhaps even wedding couples. But if you want them to be used and not tucked into a closet, this is the way to go. It's serviceable. Um, it always lays flat because it's such an even texture. I don't know. I'm a fan of edge stitch quilting. Have you gathered that yet? I just think it can be so, so beautiful. And I guess while I'm on that topic, it's a great time to mention. Um, in the next few weeks, I'm going to be opening the doors again to my freehand quilting masterclass. 
which is a full-fledged six-module robust course all about free motion quilting in this sort of style and this is in fact one of the designs that I teach in it. There's just over 30 different freehand designs in the course and my whole idea with it was to give quilters number one this huge portfolio of different styles you know some feminine some masculine some outdoorsy some geometric so all these different styles that you'll have in your repertoire but also to show you kind of my process when i'm working out a design like this like how do i work out the repeats how do i make a design that's memorable that's repeatable or if it's geometric you know, how do I get it to have good posture and look good? All those things. And, and how do I take ideas from, from wallpaper or from hotel carpets, which is my absolute favorite, and convert them into something that I can quilt and that I can remember over and over again, right? And not get caught up inside the design and lost in it. So there's a lot of theory in that course too. Anyway, all that said launch of that is going to be coming up in the next few weeks and I'm going to be doing a daily live episode on YouTube and possibly on Facebook if I can get all the moving parts in place. Um, just each day I'm just going to be talking about topics that relate to machine quilting. Each day will be live and so you can ask questions there as well but topics that aren't in the course like thread tension is one that's not in the course, actual loading, um, dealing with challenging quilts, just different things like that that have to do with this idea of making family style usable quilts and what are the most practical and efficient ways to do that. That's the kind of stuff I just love talking about. Okay, so I've rolled my quilt to advance it and now I'm smoothing it toward me. I always run along the front edge and pinch both quilt and batting and tug on it a little bit. If I don't, the batting tends to run up in the center and um, make some ripples and fullness in here. In a quilt this small, we probably wouldn't see that, but in a big quilt, that really starts to happen over repeated passes. So I get everything snugged down. I'm looking at my seam line here. Is that perfectly parallel to the rail? And if it's not, I'm gonna make some adjustments. I do not ever want to get to the bottom edge and I didn't realize it, right? If I assess and make any adjustments with each pass going down, I never get ugly surprises at the bottom. So now that we've got it pulled down and I left my machine needle in, I just pulled it forward. But now that we've got the quilt in place, I'm just running a basting stitch down this right hand edge again. And if your machine doesn't have a basting stitch, you can absolutely do that with your regular stitch as well. It really doesn't matter. I just make it about between an eighth and a quarter of an inch from the edge of the quilt so that it gets trimmed off in the binding. So it doesn't really matter what it looks like at all. It doesn't matter if it's particularly straight. I only like straight because it helps me keep a straight edge on the quilt, but the stitching does not need to be perfect. Okay, that's our left and right side basted. So again, I'm going to attach my side clamps very, very, very gently. And my front magnets. And this is a very small quilt, by the way. This is pass number two, and I think pass number three will probably be it. Okay, here's another thing I do a lot when I'm doing free motion designs, is I alternate the direction of my passes. So my first pass, I started at my left hand side and worked to the right. So now I'm gonna start at the right and work my way back. No matter how hard you try, because you are quilting in one direction, your quilting will kind of flow in that direction. And if you alternate passes, it makes the quilt as a whole look like it's in all directions, right? If you quilted them all left to right, it would kind of all look like the paisleys are leaning that way. Does that make sense? So I just get in the habit of doing that always and it keeps keeps my quilting looking very organic and even across the whole thing doesn't look like it was quilted in rows we want to avoid that 
So I basically just started where I left off. So I'm going to try quilting a manual mode because then it would remove the red cameras for you. Um, let's talk about that for a minute in case you don't know what that is. So manual mode is when I set a needle speed on my machine. So in some machines it's a percentage. On my machine it's a count, a number of stitches per inch. And when I push the start button, my needle is just going to start going at that rate, that many stitches per minute, right? And it's entirely up to me then to make my movements smooth and my movements determine the stitch length, right? Because the needle's just going. So if I go, you know, if I'm moving my machine quickly, I'm going to get big stitches. If I'm moving my machine too slowly, I'm going to get little tiny stitches. So that's kind of up to me to do. You may wonder why the heck would you do that? And there are good reasons for and against. Um, the stitch regulator is a wonderful, wonderful tool so that you don't have to think about stitch length because I'm going to have to focus on it a little bit now in manual mode. But manual is also very smooth. Somehow, because the machine is not constantly adjusting for that stitch length, it's not constantly regulating, it gives a smoother action. And I like the feel of that. When I'm quilting on my, on my own with my headphones on and just head down churning out quilts, that's what I use the most often. I just find it the most smooth and rhythmic. And I even prefer that sound in my ears to the constant regulating motor, right? Reasons why it may not work for today is because of these slightly bulky seams. I've been slowing down quite a bit for them, so we'll see how it goes. If I'm having trouble with that, certainly if I start breaking threads, then I'm going to have to go back to my, to my slower um, regulated so that I can pause and um, adjust my speed to those seams, right? So these are all the things that, that I consider when I'm determining which one to use. Neither one is wrong, but let's give it a try, and I'm not sure what speed I want. We're just going to start at a thousand stitches per inch or, or per minute and see how that goes. Here we go. And I can tell you already that's way too slow. Now I'm at 1400, much better. I do not think I exaggerate at all when I say that stitching this way when you can, will make you a better quilter because it forces you to move rhythmically and smoothly. You can't swoosh around a corner and then slow down for a little bit or you're going to get very odd stitches. So this really helps you to get smooth in your quilting. It seems to be doing absolutely fine with the seam allowances, so we're going to go with this for a while. Now, speaking of bulky seam allowances, it may seem a little counterintuitive, but I actually try to stitch over those bulky seam allowances. My reasoning is this. If I stitch nearby them but not on them, they're going to stick out like buttons on my finished quilt, and I don't want that to happen. So when I do have a quilt that does have bulky seam allowances, I purposely try to stitch on or very, very near to those seam allowances and it produces a quilt that lays much flatter when it's all finished. That tip I got years ago from Jody Robinson who's an excellent machine quilter also. She was teaching a class at my guild and up till that point you know I had kind of made an effort to avoid those seam allowances because they're hard to stitch through and maybe you risk you know breaking a needle or breaking your thread so it makes sense to avoid right? Not so, said Jody, and I completely agree. Once I tried it and saw what a difference it made and how the quilt laid, I was sold on that.
Hopefully that makes it a lot easier for you to see, to not have those little red camera eyes shining under there. I began my quilting at 10 stitches per inch, so I'm trying to keep my manual stitches now to be a similar size to that. And can you see how I've kind of reversed the process of quilting wider in the back toward the left side? And now I'm angling toward the right as I get nearer to myself. So that I've never got an awkward corner at the far back of the quilt that I can't reach. Honestly, this diagonal idea also helps with keeping things looking uh, natural and organic and not in a row. So lots of good things about it. It really helps keep your quilting looking um, randomized, and that's a good thing. You don't want your paisleys all to be pointing in the same direction, and you certainly don't want them all in a row. This quote, by the way, belongs to a client named Bev. Bev recently sent me, I think, five quilts in the mail. We've never met in person, but I've done a fair bit of quilting for her. She does beautiful piecing. So it is certainly a pleasure to work on her quilts. And we broke a thread. So the lesson from that is for one thing, I went a long ways without that happening, so I'm happy about that, but I'll probably slow down my speed just a touch, because I think that is just due to going over those thick seam allowances at that speed. I do run the risk of shredding a thread that way, and that is indeed what happened. So we'll try slowing it down a bit and see if that fixes it. You know me, when it happens once, I just kind of chalk it up to experience when it happens more than once, then I've got to start making changes, so. I've slowed down the speed to, I'm at about 12.50 now. So that is stitches per inch. And I'm just backing up to a point um, in my stitching because that is the easiest place to um, splice the thread without it really showing. It's probably difficult for you to see, but there's a point of my paisley right here. So I've stopped about three stitches shy of that, and I'm gonna start my new stitching right at the point, overlapping what was already there, and that will help to anchor it. And I'll do a few lock stitches as well, and this will be perfectly serviceable in the quilt. There is no worries about this coming undone. These tight little stitches right here, there's five stitches in about an eighth of an inch. Those are a lock. They're not coming undone at all. Let me get my thread tails out of the way because I'm not going to want to stop once I'm in manual mode. Here we go. So now I have to think about this a little bit because I have to move a little more slowly since I've slowed down that speed. If I move at the same pace, I'm going to get bigger stitches than I was getting before. I don't know if that small adjustment is visible on camera, but I am trying to be conscious of moving just a little more slowly than I did earlier.
Every so often I have an awkward corner that I tuck a funny shaped paisley into. I just do what I need to to try and maintain an evenness of texture. I feel like what catches the eye when the quilt is finished would be a large unquilted spot, larger than the spacing of my paisleys. It, that will catch the eye more than one awkwardly shaped paisley. Can you see me aiming for those seams? Honestly, that to me is one of the beauties of quilting designs like this absolutely freehand, is I can fudge or adjust these little paisleys really easily, an eighth of an inch or so to make them hit those seams and lay down flat. If this was a digitized design, I would not have control over that as it's quilting. The spacing would be preset and what it is, it is. So I honestly think free motion quilting and a quilt like this gives a superior result. There again, I made that little tiny paisley just to hit that seam allowance that was in a kind of largish unquilted spot. It seems like such a little thing, but taken over and over again over a quilt top, it's gonna make such a beautiful flat smooth top as opposed to having these little knobby bulges from seam allowances. There's another one right there. thread again. I was just thinking, now I wonder if I should talk about that and then I thought if I talk about it I'm going to jinx it. <laughs> so I think we will go back to our um, stitch regulation. You've had a good opportunity to see it now without the little red lights shining. I have a little bit better success with that when I'm able to control that speed over the over the speed bumps so to speak. Although it's not doing too badly. It's honestly not doing too badly. Uh, where did it break exactly? So what happened is the top thread broke, right? And so I'm coming back and pulling up the bobbin thread now. And I always undo a little bit because when the thread breaks, it yanks and pulls the tension awry. And so I always like to undo a little bit. For sure, I want to get back to the last point. But I'm this point is only about three quarters of an inch away and I can see that the top thread is kind of shredded there. So I'm going to undo to the next point because I want to make sure I get rid of any odd stitching that I maybe can't even see from the top side of the quilt. That little point is knotted. See, I'm telling you, a couple stitches in quick succession. It's as good as a knot. I'm just working my way back to the last point. Move the machine a little. I'm not sure how much is in the camera. And one more. There we go. So again, I've got both the top and the bobbin thread. I'm just trimming them close to the quilt. I'm going to start my stitching at the actual point, overlap over those few stitches with a few more lock stitches and all of that will be thoroughly anchored in place. And I'll put my stitch regulator back on. Where's the point? There it is. 
I do not have a laser light on my machine, so I just do this by eye. And that's one of the reasons that I like having a foot that has more visibility than a cup clip. It's quite hard to line up by eye with that cup clip on. But, you know, you have to make choices. I'm going to pause and trim those threads, and I'm going to trim the one from the last splice if I can find them too. There they are. And by the way, these are my favorite, current favorite little scissors. They're by Kai, and they're a four inch blunt tip, but they have this little curve. These are the greatest little clips to have at your sewing machine. I don't have a link for them because I couldn't find them on Amazon, but I know if you go to Kai's website and look for four inch blunt and curved tip, you can find them. They're awesome, super sharp little clips. If you are enjoying this episode, I'd love if you would give a thumbs up to the episode. Also subscribe. And if you click the bell, you will receive notifications whenever I'm going live. As well, I do endeavor to send out a newsletter a couple of days before these live episodes with a photograph of the project that's in mind and some idea of what the topics might be. So there is a link in the description if you wanted to sign up for my newsletter. Or you can also just go to my website, stitchedbysusan.com, and you'll get a little pop-up that invites you to provide your name and email address. We call these episodes live and unscripted because they are unedited. They're in real time. Those thread breaks that happen, they'll never get edited out. They're part of the process. And that's honestly my goal, is to show you um, for reals what quilting looks like in my studio. So we try to air these twice a month. They're always on Friday and they're always 9 a.m. in the morning. The date varies. I'm doing some traveling this year and so um, I can't tell you which Fridays always, but it's another reason to get on the newsletter so you know when they're coming up. All right, we're doing the last pass. I'm gonna move Stella to the other side. We've changed our camera arrangements. One of you dear folks wrote in last week and said something about the fact that the overhead camera being at one side of the machine and the close-up camera being at the other side, they appeared to be running in opposing directions, kind of, for viewing purposes. So we're like, okay, let's see if we can switch that up. So we're trying different camera angles today than we've had before. So let us know how that's feeling. We're always trying to improve. We're always learning. Let me just get this basted in place, you guys, and then we'll take a moment for a breather and some questions. Um, can we see the back of the quilt? We can. I'm going to show you guys a trick. This is a small quilt, so it's not very severe, but when you're working on a large quilt, sometimes this whole center will start to pull in as you're quilting. And when you advance the quilt, you can see your new area seems a little bit wider on both sides. Like, what do I do with that? I want to baste a straight line, but if I do, you know, I'm going to be cutting off the edge of that quilt. Here's a trick. I'm just going to move Stella a little bit. The first and easiest is just to grab, uh, can I do it at this end? Yes, is just to grab the backing and tug on it a little bit. That sometimes is enough, but if it's not, I literally massage this roll hard. And I usually do it from the other side of the machine, then I don't have to reach like this, but massage this hard out to the edge and pull on that backing until you've sort of stretched out that quilting again, right? Because you know this is flat and smooth. You're not overstretching this. 
you're just trying to pull that quilting out and not let it be pulling in and narrowing up the back end of the quilt. So that, one of my quilting friends calls that milking the quilt. I'm not quite sure why, but it is effective. Just massage it hard and tug it and maybe do it a few times from the center outwards until you get that back in shape. Okay. Whew, that was my calisthenics. Reach at arm's length and milk the quilt. There's just a little bit of sag in the minky. That's what I was trying to pull flat there. And I see that I'm not going to make it quite to the front. So I'm just going to have to advance the quilt a little touch to get that front edge basted. And then we'll have to back up a little bit for the quilting. But I'm going to go ahead and baste it all as opposed to just leaving that little bit undone. Now here again, if you're not comfortable just winging it as I am doing, then you might want to walk along your quilt and put some pins in it at this point to anchor that front edge. I've done this so many times I'm pretty comfortable with just casting my eye around and in my peripheral vision watching it. Something else I want to point out, we've got the close-up camera on, yes we do. Can you see this under here? There's a gray thread right under there, I don't know if it shows. Because I see it, now is a great time to pull it out. Look at that. Perfect. There are needles that are super helpful in doing that later, but it's always easier beforehand. Again, I'm keeping my basting stitches between an eighth and a quarter of an inch from the edge of the quilt so that it will fall right inside the binding. So this never has to be taken out. So it doesn't have to be pretty necessarily but you do want to keep it under that quarter inch so that the person binding it does not have to take it out. There we are, we're basted. I'm going to back it up a couple inches and then we'll take some questions. Alright. Christine, all those HSTs, do you try to hit the intersecting points? As much as I can, Christine, or at least close to them, like less than a quarter of an inch, maybe even an eighth. Stitching close to them is what helps them lay nice and flat in the finished quilt. So I'm hitting as many as I can. <laughs> Gail, how big are your paisley loops? Oh gosh, Gail. The inner one is anywhere from an inch and a quarter to some of them are even two inches long. And then they're about half inch spacing after that. So the whole paisley is perhaps three inches. That's very general, very general. <laughs> Janice, can you repeat or type in the name of the store for the scissors? Absolutely, it's Kai, K-A-I. They have great scissors and rotary cutters across the board, but this little trimmer is my favorite at the long arm. Mr. Producer is gonna put a link in the comments. Look at him go. Okay, Roxanne. Since you load the backing on the bottom bar, do you need to allow for more backing fabric? No, you don't, Roxanne, because the, the leader on that bottom bar is long enough. It comes right up, you know, to the front of the rail in front of me. So it, it does not take any more, any additional backing. Nope. Janice, do you know when enrollment for the masterclass will open and when it will start? I don't have the precise dates in mind set yet Janice but it's going to be late April when it opens so it'll largely be the month of April when I'm on every day that's general I'm still finalizing those dates but that gives you an idea Martha this quilt is exquisitely made perfect points everywhere my compliments to the maker I agree Bev did a really great job piecing it 
And like I said, I have several of her quilts here and they're all great. Janice, milking the quilt makes total sense. You must be a farm girl too. <laughs> okay. Um, and I did mention earlier on, someone commented on the quilt that is behind me. And it is Fanfare is the pattern by Krista Moser, K-R-I-S-T-A. And it's a wonderful pattern. All Krista's patterns are well-written, easy, lovely. Okay. I quilted last from right to left. So this time I'm going to go from left to right. I still need to put my side clamps on. We don't need the front... Um, magnetic bars this time because we've got the basting in place so that's not going anywhere so again my side clamps have very 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 light tension on them just for a refresher and if you're just joining too this minky backing the the thing to watch out for the challenge with minky backing is of course the fact that it is so stretchy so I've got my selvages at my top and bottom rail so the least amount of stretch now is crosswise on the fabric but lengthwise on my long arm so that I don't risk over tightening it and I have purposely kept my rails at a low level of tension just enough so there's no real sag or possibility of creases in that backing. The most stretch in the minky fabric is from side to side now or what would have been lengthwise in the cut of fabric. So that's why I'm putting my side clamps on very very lightly it's basically just the weight of the clamp and these are these are elastic straps but they don't have much tension on them at all i do not want to stretch that minky because what will happen if i do is when i release it from the tension of the long arm it'll want to curl in because the minky will actually be less of it than the cotton top so we don't want to do that so that's the big key is just don't overstretch it only pull it out both ways enough to keep any wrinkles from forming. That's all you need. So we're quilting a paisley design. It's entirely free motion. I'm using Isocord 100% poly thread. I do love poly threads ever so much. I am stitching in stitch regulated mode right now and I have 10 stitches per inch set. And here we go. I do currently have a ruler work foot on my machine. It's the 72S specifically. I would not need to. I could certainly do this with a number nine darning foot, which is a smaller profile and a slimmer needle, but this is kind of my all purpose foot. It's the one I tend to just leave on my machine at all times. Then if I want a cup clip, I can just slip it on. If I want to do ruler work or even just a little stitching in the ditch with the aid of a ruler, it's just a matter of a minute to, to slip the ruler plate on and I don't have to change feet, although changing feet is not difficult either, but this just tends to be my personal go-to foot. So in case you're wondering why I've got a ruler work foot on, that's why. It's not only for ruler work.
when I did that last advance, you saw I, I couldn't fit quite all of it in the throat space. So I had to back up a little bit after my basting to do my quilting. So this time across, I'm not quilting as far forward as I could possibly, and here's why. I've only got six or seven inches left at the bottom here, and I want enough maneuverability to be able to fit in my pattern. So I'm not filling it as far as I can reach, or I'd only have a little space about three inches wide to quilt, and it would be hard to fit paisleys in that. So that's just a little tip when you're coming to your last row. Uh, leave yourself enough in that very last pass that you can maneuver around in it. I might even do a little less as I work my way across, just to give myself that bit more room in the last one. Bit more room to turn corners, to fit an extra little paisley in. It all helps. When we were doing the countdown for the show early on this morning, we had a little promotional video playing about our cruise. But in case you missed that one, let me just tell you, uh, Mr. Producer and I are hosting a quilting cruise, a machine quilting cruise, uh, January 18 to 25 of 2025. So next year. And we have quilt artists, Beth Ann Nemesh and Sam Alberts joining us. So Beth Ann, Sam, and myself will be teaching quilting classes. Plus, we're all three of us entrepreneurs, and so we're going to be doing some um, informal, kind of over coffee and croissants, business breakouts with just some topics that we think are of interest to those who are just getting started in a quilting business or thinking about it. So all three of us will be teaching, uh, speaking into those, but also we have a videographer coming along on the cruise. So there's not going to be a ton of time for you all to quilt at the machines, although we're still kind of working out on some of those details, but all of the main classes will be filmed and uh, videoed and shown on an overhead screen. And then all those classes will be available to all cruisers to watch for some months afterwards. So that videographer is going to be talking about camera work and lighting and things like that in some of the business breakaways. Also, we have Courtney Kimball of One Common Thread joining us. One Common Thread is um, Courtney and her sister Kim work with ladies in Honduras to help them create sustainable income with quilt making and prepping and selling kits and things like that. So she's going to be coming along on the cruise too and just talking about that organization and giving you a chance to learn more about it and contribute if you wish. So that's going to be really fun to meet with them. Um, someone mentioned earlier that if someone has not seen Sam's website, they ought to go and look, and I totally agree. So here's the two teachers. Beth Ann is whitearborquilting.com, and Sam is Quilting Curve Studio. So you can search for them on social media or on YouTube by their names or their business names, and you'll find them. They're both very gifted quilters. We all three have quite different styles. Um, so we're really trying to put together a roster of courses that are, uh, cover a broad range of topics, but also that still work together. So hopefully you can come home from that cruise just with this wealth of ideas, um, on all kinds of topics and in several different styles of quilting. So we're trying to make all our classes kind of play nice together. It's been a fun planning process. They are two very gifted ladies, and it's going to be really, really fun to get to teach together. Um, I know Mr. Producer will be putting a link for the cruise in the chat. 
So have a look at that if you want any more details about the classes, the times. Um, we're sailing on the Celebrity Equinox in the Caribbean, but all the rest of the details you can find on the website there. So, What could be better than quilting on the sunny ocean in January? Of course, I'm a person that's sort of always lived in the North Country, so anywhere warm in January appeals to me. <laughs> stop right there needle down and roll my quilt up a couple of inches and then we'll be able to finish so this is your last chance to type in any questions or comments if you have them um, I mentioned earlier we're trying a new camera view out today basically from my left side as opposed to from my right which we've done in the past let us know what you think of that uh, one viewer thought that that would be helpful in conjunction with the fact that my close-up camera is also on the left and it would be more wouldn't be quite so distracting to your eye so let us know what you think of that we're always open to ideas we're always trying to improve i mentioned earlier you're able to support this channel by going to buymeacoffee.com and forward slash stitched by susan all of that goes toward bettering our production equipment any dollars that come in there and we are so appreciative of you all who have helped us pull this show together Here's a piece of trivia for you. Dave and I were calculating the other day and we estimate, as best as we can tell, because it kind of comes chopped up into bits, but as best as we can tell, it takes us about 16 man hours to put on one episode. So that gives you kind of an idea of what we invest in it and we're happy to invest our time, but we sure do appreciate you guys for contributing a little bit of the funds because it was a long time of doing it for sort of no visible reward before we started seeing any YouTube dollars coming in. So we have really appreciated your contributions that way and it's enabled us to get better and better. So there was another little awkward moment you guys saw me do. Um, can we see this area on the close-up camera, Dave, or am I, too, am I out of it? I don't know if you'll be able to see it without me moving. Yeah, you can. So there was just an area up here that was bigger than any of the spaces in the Paisleys, and I saw that out of the corner of my eye. I mentioned this earlier, but I know this to be true. Big chunks of unquilted catch your eye more than some awkward stitching. So I opted to do one more lap around my paisley and I literally crossed over my lines and came out the other side. I don't know if you can see what I did and that's that's absolutely fine. Just know that when I'm weighing whether to put in some awkward stitching or an awkwardly shaped bit or leave it unquilted, I opt for the awkwardly shaped bit because the unquilted part will really catch your eye because it will be puffy in the finished quilt. And along this bottom edge, I'm using that same train of thought when I determine whether I need to put in a little bit extra down there somewhere at the very edge of the quilt. If there's an area that looks bigger than the spacing in the paisley, then I know I need to get over there and tuck a little something in. Here's a good example right here. See this big space in here? 
I have to get up there and fill that in some way. And I'm going to do it just by putting one single, almost feather plume shape from a paisley in there. Is it a true paisley? Absolutely not. But is it better to have it quilted than leave it unquilted? Yes, absolutely. We just ran out of bobbin thread. Okay, how convenient is that, you guys? I'm like an inch and a half from my traveling in the basting stitch. All I have to undo is that inch and a half and tuck a fresh bobbin in. You see that right here? If this had happened in the middle of the quilt, I would not obviously have undone to the edge of the quilt. I would just have undone to the last point and specifically the last point where my tension was good. So because I let my bobbin thread go until it ran completely out, those last couple of inches don't have proper tension on them and you can see it because the top thread will lay flat. So I always undo far enough that I've got good looking stitches. And these look fine, so I'm leaving them right there. My thread is pretty well anchored at that point. I'm gonna grab another bobbin. We'll overlap those stitches a little bit and we'll start going again. I already had my bobbin winding on the side of the machine. I'm just going to grab my gauge and do a quick tension check. Guess I've got to put it in the bobbin casing first, don't I? This actually is half a bobbin left over from another project, but it's a great time to use it up. Perfect. Great time to use it up when I just have a little bit of stitching left. gauge away. Grab my bobbin thread and hang on. And away we go. Just gonna feel underneath. I'm not quite sure what that loop was from. I still don't know. I'll check the backing after I unload the quilt. It all looks good here. Ah, uh, which direction are we going? Decisions, decisions. nearing the end so fire your questions off if you have any 
do hit that thumbs up button if you have enjoyed this episode. Um, we do call these live and unscripted because we don't edit out the bloopers. Red breaks, the bob and run outs, all of those things stay. Um, and we do try to air these live and unscripted episodes every, twice every month. Always on Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. But the Fridays vary. So sign up for my newsletter if you'd like to know in advance when they are happening and what the topic is. I do try and post a photograph and send that out usually on the Wednesday before. Um, so that you can see what the, the quilt is that's planned and what some of the topics are that I'll be addressing in that particular project. So you can do that either in the description below this episode. There's a link for my newsletter or just by going to my website, stitchedbysusan.com and you'll get a little pop-up there inviting you to type in your name and email address. I am coming up on another um, release of my Freehand Quilting Masterclass course. It is all about this type of freehand quilting. Um, a lot of it is teaching in depth just over 30 different designs, different genres, different types, different themes like this one. This one is included, but it also focuses on how I sort of construct my designs. I call it the anatomy of a design, you know, how to make it repeat, how to remember it, how to move smoothly throughout it, how to make it more graceful, all those things. So there's a lot of that theory in there because the goal is that at the end of it, you feel much more confident about creating your own designs. So you see something that interests you, some wallpaper, some fabric, how do you make a quilting design out of that? So that's all part of it too. So that's going to be opening up for enrollment in late April. But for all the month of April, I'll be doing some promotion. I'll be doing um, daily live sessions on hopefully Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram all at the same time. If I can get, you know, everything working together. But lots of content coming your way. Lots of opportunity to ask questions, to even have input on what some of that content is and what some of those topics are for the live sessions each day. I would love your input on that. So more information on the Freehand Quilting Masterclass also on my website. Check for classes there. We are at the end of our baby quilt. Oh my goodness, it's so cute. So, so cute. Has anyone chimed in, Mr. Producer, about my choice of Paisley design? What are we thinking? And can you can sort of see it on the minky backing. There's just nothing like minky for showing off quilting. And also, I promised you guys a tip at the end of the show for dealing with minky fuzz. If you've ever cut minky with your rotary cutter, you know that your mat and your room <laughs> are covered in fuzz for days and days afterwards. But do I ever have a trick for you? Okay, it's a little bit multi-step. I've walked you through my process of quilting, which is that I always baste all of the perimeter edge now has a basting line. So a straight row of stitching all the way around the quilt, right? So that's step one. Step two is you unload your quilt and you take it to your cutting table floor, wherever you're going to cut. And you flip it upside down, so it's backing side up. And you put painter's tape all the way along that seam line, sort of straddling it. And it doesn't have to be precise but you're going to be cutting a quarter inch outside that basting line, right? With your rotary cutter. So make sure that's covered. Run this tape all the way around the perimeter of the quilt, flip it back over and do the trimming from the right side. All that fuzz sticks to the tape. You get no fuzz in your cutting mat and it does not fly all about in your room. After you're done cutting, you just peel the tape off the quilt, peel the tape off the extra backing throw it all away, clean as a whistle. It works like a son of a gun, really. Painter's tape. I'm telling you, I should buy shares. <laughs> okay, any more questions or thoughts? I'll get in the middle. I think I need coffee in hand for this, you guys. I'll lean back from the quilt. Sharon, if you sign up for the master class and you miss a class, can you pick it up before the next class begins? Super, Sharon. Um, 
in general, the, the class is all pre-recorded. The lessons are pre-recorded. So the way that I deliver the class is one module each week opens up to you. But in fact, you can go through them whenever you like. So you don't have to attend any live sessions. You can watch it whenever you want to and at whatever speed you want to. I support it with some live sessions where you can ask questions and talk to me about it, but you can go through it at absolutely your own pace. There's no need to catch up. You can even, you know, listen to them and only quilt one or two of the designs and move on to the next one and quilt one or two. And then months or years down the road, come back and catch the rest of the design. So it's really easy in that respect. There's no pace that you need to match. Carol, my daughter did Minky on my long arm. Any hints for all the lint? So do you mean that there's lint all over the long arm now? And if that, I would get a vacuum, maybe even a start with a bigger vac and then maybe get one of the finer office type vacs to get it like out of your tracks and things like that. Um, cause, cause lint is kind of your enemy at the long arm. So you, you will want to find a way to clean that up. Um, canned air can get it out of the little tiny tight places too. Raylan, new at long arming. How do you get your brain and hands to work together? I'm finding it difficult. Raylan, I'm not really sorry, but I have to tell you the truth. It is a matter of practice. It is so much like learning handwriting. And when you begin, you absolutely feel like a kindergartner trying to write their name. It is square and awkward and all the circles don't come out round, but persevere because it simply is practice. It simply is a matter of learning for your brain and your hands to coordinate. I hesitate to say muscle memory because it's not exactly that, but it certainly is hand-eye coordination and it just comes with practice, but it does get better. Penny, I'm a new subscriber and enjoy watching how you do things. Do you ever remove the quilt at the end and show the quilting on the back? Yes, sometimes I do, and I'm happy to do that today. Actually, after we've gone through some more comments, I'm happy to do that because it will really show up today. Catherine, have you spoken about the quilt behind you today? I did briefly, Catherine. I'll say it one more time. The pattern is called Fanfare. And it's by Krista Moser, K-R-I-S-T-A is how she spells Krista. All of her patterns have these 60 degree angles in them and they're all easy. So don't be intimidated by that. There's no Y seams and Krista writes beautiful, beautifully explained, beautifully photographed, great patterns. I've made quite a few of them. Sally, I've never used a bobbin gauge. What is the tension reading you look for on your bobbin gauge? I personally look for 210 to 220. That is number one, a recommendation of my Bernina machine. That's the tension that they recommend. And it's also a pretty good one for the thread that I'm using. And it will certainly vary um, from thread to thread. Like I'm still looking for a 210 to 220 reading, but I may have to tighten my tension in order for a fine thread to read the same, if that makes sense. Um, and monofilament thread and threads that are very different, you might look for a different result. But for my all purpose, 40 weight thread, 210 to 220 works well. Is that gauge something I can use for piecing or is it just for long arming? Um, certainly the bobbin casing is the M class bobbin size, which is typically what you would see in a long arm, not generally in a sewing machine. So I don't think it would fit your sewing machine bobbins. Um, I've never really thought of that, honestly. I don't have a great answer for you. For me, it checks two things. It checks how hard the pull is, and it also checks how even the pull is, right? So my little gauge, I'm looking for a nice smooth reading. It goes to 220 and it just rests there as I'm pulling my thread. So that's what I'm trying to gauge. Do you need to do that at your sewing machine? Probably not. It does not stitch at the high speeds that long arms do as a rule. So I don't think that would be an issue. I'm not an expert on that one, I'm sorry. Alyssa, what needle do you use with Minky? Also, can you show in slow motion how you bring your thread to stop at stopping? Sure, I'll go back and do that. And, and to the top, yeah, I kind of got that. Um, what was the first part? What needle do you use? Yes, I just have my 9014 universal needle on right now. I've also been playing lately with using a top stitch needle, also in the 9014 side size. A top stitch needle has a bit longer eye in it and the scarf is a bit lower, I think. <laughs> I think. I haven't looked at one today. Um, both of those work, but I did not change. I don't have a specialty needle on for this particularly today. 
Jan, do you have a preference of batting when doing an all batik quilt? I usually recommend poly down as it's lighter and I don't want the shrinkage of cotton batting to affect the smooth looks of batik. I'm not an expert in that one, Jan. Poly is certainly a good choice if you do not want any shrinkage. That seems to be so much a matter of personal opinion as to what you want the finished result to look like. I have not found any particular batting to be necessarily better or worse in terms of like bearding because batiks are known for being uh, tight, tight fabrics and often your, your batting will poke through a little bit because the needle has to force its way through so much. But I usually use the 80-20 cotton poly with it with good results. So, Jason, I'm never able to go right or left without thread shredding and breaking. Guessing it's the machine. Oh, this is Mary Ellen. Oh, Mary Ellen, this is a question that long armors hear so, so, so much. There are so many factors that go into that because it all has to do with the timing of your needle going down and the bobbin spinning around and catching the thread. And that is a little different when moving from right to left because that direction is always the problem area. You know, things you might try if you're on a long arm where you're able to turn the needle just a tiny, tiny touch. So if it's pointing at 630, maybe maybe make it 625 or 635, you know, on a clock, just a tiny turn. That's one thing. Slowing down can help. The top stitch needle with the longer eye in it might help, right? Type of needle makes a difference. Make sure you have a big enough needle that the thread is flowing very freely through it and there's no restriction there. Like all these little things add up. So give a try to some of those. Try to talk to other people that have the same machine as you do, honestly. I think that's your best source of finding some valuable experience there. Betsy, can you do a close up of the scroll design in the large white star in the quilt behind you? I honestly can't. I have no way of close upping the pattern. Oh, there we go. I can move out of the way. So you can see I did a sort of six pointed, de six pointed design in the middle and then basically a border in each of those frames around the star. It's quite a few years since I quilted that one actually. Gee, this quilt obviously does not have them, but have you ever worked on a quilt with flange sashing and do you quilt over the top or do you have a way to move that flange out of the way? If it is just like I most often see it um, within a border so there's just a single row of it and I will tend to suggest to the quilt maker then that I quilt an all over design in the middle and I just quilt right up to that flange and then I quilt something else in the border that quilts in toward that flange and leave it at that. I don't like to quilt over it. It doesn't look good. It spoils the look of the flange. So that's my personal opinion. <laughs> Roxanne, if you need to adjust tension, do you always adjust top tension and not bobbin? Typically, Roxanne, I first make sure I'm happy with my bobbin tension. Like I'll set it with my gauge appropriate to the thread that I'm using and I will only do very small fine tuning from the top. So the bulk of my adjustments are actually done on the bobbin and then I just gently fine tune at the top, very small amounts. I don't see it, Dave. Bev, thanks so much for your beautiful work. The Paisley is perfect for this little girl quilt. This is Bev's quilt, so I'm glad you're so happy with it, Bev. P.S. Dave does great work, too. Yes, he does. So fun. I'm glad you're happy with it, Bev. Bev gave me carte blanche to choose my own quilting design and just go with it. So I'm glad she's happy. Okay, let's do a quick close-up of pulling up the bobbin thread. Um, where could I do this off to the side? Let me just advance the quilt a tiny touch and we'll do it up on the, on the batting that's at the front. And this is something, by the way, if you're working at a domestic machine, you'll be doing a very similar process. It's universally true that before you begin stitching, you want to have both threads in your hand. If you only start with your needle thread on the top, you will 100% get a thread gnarl on the bottom side of the quilt. That's always ugly. So the way to do it is to hang on to that top thread and take one stitch. How you do that will vary from machine to machine. I have one of the buttons on my machine set to take one stitch. And can you see my little bobbin thread is right there, little loop. So I just pull it up. And I, I usually pull a bit longer tail. I want something to hang on to. 
And now I've got them both in my hand and then I go back to where that came up, which is really hard to see on the batting. If I move the thread a bit, you might be able to see it there. And that's where my stitching will then begin, is where they both came up. So now I'm hanging on to them both. So depending, you know, if you're at a sit down machine, you might just put your fingers down on the flat on the machine bed and that will hold them. Um, at a long arm, I'll show you a trick. If you, can't, if you can't do it with your hands easily, you can also put a big old pin over here and kind of figure eight around that pin, right? That's one way to hold it secure. Just something that will hold both those thread tails before you begin your stitching. And then off you go. And whatever lock stitch you want to do, that's kind of a separate process, but that's how you get your bobbin thread up. And when I finish quilting, I basically do the same process. Because again, I don't want a thread tail on the bottom that's going to risk getting caught in future stitching, right? So what I do is I grab the needle thread, pull a bit of it. Oh, we're changing cameras, sorry. I've grabbed the needle thread. And again, this may look a little different at your domestic, but the process is largely the same. Grab hold of that needle thread, take one stitch again. And now if I move my foot away, you'll see. If I start tugging, can you see that loop? It's really hard to see on the white, I know it is, but there's a loop and that loop is bobbin thread. Pull a bit of a tail and I move, I hang on to it and I move far enough away that I know I've got a string underneath to begin my next one with. Does that make sense? But now I've got this, I've got my top thread here. I'll show you again. And that bobbin thread is the loop. So I'm gonna hang on to all that mess and clip all three of them. Scissors is upside down. The end result now is there's no tail on the underside of my quilt. I've pulled that bobbin thread snugly to the top and I've trimmed it up here. There's no tail at the bottom. That's the easiest way to finish. There we go. Okay, another question apparently has come in. Let me move Stella off to the side. Sharon, is there a chart for the bobbin tensions for different machines? I'm not aware that there is, Sharon, because who, who would publish that, right? Each machine publishes their own, each brand publishes their own recommendations. So I would go straight to your manufacturer, and if you've got a manual on hand or can find it online, I'm confident your manual will recommend a bobbin tension. It's measured in millinewtons, mls, mls, mns. Oh gosh, now I don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, it's a consistent measurement from brand to brand. I don't even know what the unit is. I'm sorry about that. Um, I just go by the number. So I, I guarantee you, your brand will have a recommendation on that. Okay, you guys, one last time, thumbs up if you've enjoyed this episode. And I sure appreciate you joining me. We are back to host Live and Unscripted two Fridays a month, always at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Sign up for my newsletter if you want that advanced notification of what the project will be and a photograph of it and the topics involved. So we appreciate you showing up. It's been fun spending a couple of hours with you. Enjoy the rest of your day.